said, so let's do it. Let's start with the first panel. I'm very, 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 very excited. The first panel is uh, the tech we want is political. Um, it is a little bit early in the morning to start with politics, but we thought that it was very important to start with politics because sometimes we, we tend to separate. And when we, uh, we, we see like, you know, like every other week, we see one of our leaders, um, we see one, one of our leaders, a president or you know, prime minister shaking hands with one of the big tech companies. That, that the only sole fact should make us aware that when we are talking about technology, we are talking about politics. So welcome to the second session. Uh, my name is Renata Avila, for those who are just joining. I'm the CEO of, of the Open Knowledge Foundation and I will be the moderator today. Um, uh, we already went through the housekeeping rules, so we uh, go straight uh, to the to the substance. Uh, this uh, panel is um, uh, three wonderful panelists are joining us today to help us unpack the broader political context of what we are uh, speaking today, um, uh, the political implications and the. Uh, global implica implications that uh, technology has. Um, for example, uh, in July this, this year, so a massive disruption with the crowd strike incident, an incident that paralyzed entire airports, for example. And not so long ago in September, just a few months after this incident, we saw a very, a very terrible situation with, you know, Majors exploding uh, and injuring thousands of people, uh, thousands of civilians in, in Lebanon. So uh, not only technology is political, but it is heating up. And, and as we see many global efforts trying to create positive agendas and trying to create uh, a little bit of coherence in, and, and at least some uh, forms of loose governance around it, uh, the main question that we want to present to the to the speakers today is we are we are aware of the complexity of the system. We are aware of uh, the uh, relation, sometimes toxic relationship without uh, we, without any democratic governance when uh, big tech companies get involved into politics. We are aware of the deficiencies of technology itself that is not delivering rights. And so the main question that, that I want to present to the panelists that I'm going to introduce in a moment is, in a world submerging crises and conflict, is there a space, do we need to stay in this broken building? Do we need to remain in a space where uh, technology is not delivering for the people and it's only delivering for those who profit from it? Or is, is there any space, is there any window of opportunity for the radical shift? What role will uh, the way we build technology play in it? Is, is, is it already happening anywhere in the world where, like, you know, um, a government or a community is shifting to more like sustainable and democratic, uh, a democratic way of engaging with uh, digital? Uh, so we have today three star panelists, uh, Anita Gumurti from uh, IT, she is the director of IT for Change, but also she's one of the most prominent voices in the international spaces uh, um, advocating for a different, uh, a different, uh, more democratic uh, technology landscape. We have Olaji Ajadeji, who is dealing every day with governments, trying to pursue the same goals, to lead him, lead, uh, lead them to, um, a, a, through the Digital Public Goods Alliance, of uh, actually implemented technologies that respect rights and that are open and transparent and accountable. And we have Ponselet Ileleji, who is uh, doing the very, very important and hard work uh, bottom up, war, uh, working uh, with communities uh, in many countries in Africa and uh, com uh, based in Gambia, uh, trying to build the next generation of critical thinking and skills that will basically source the uh, tech we want. So uh, let's start the panel and let's start with Anita. Anita, you have been like very recently, you know, in many places around the world and, and concretely you were one of the leading voices in New York at the Global Digital Compact where, like, you know, a happy new plan for the future of technology was drafted and approved by global leaders. But 
Are we signing off for staying in the same broken build, broken building and just adding patches? Or do you see any political willingness to move out of that building and build it that we want? Uh, thank you so much, Renata. What an honor to be part of this uh, entire event. Am I audible? Good. Um, I uh, really look forward to the archives and all the recordings. And also I'm honored to share space with other co-panelists. Um, I want to say that, uh, should I should I take about eight to 10 minutes? How much time do I have? You have around that, yes, please. Yeah, all right, great. So um, let me just begin by saying that the tech we want, you know, politically speaking, uh, is actually uh, a new social paradigm. So we are looking at new social relations and we're really not, uh, we're defocusing on the technology. I think when we are asking about digital, asking for or calling out to uh, the agenda of digital justice or digital solidarity um, or uh, people's digital sovereignty, we are actually saying we want a new sociality. So that I think is a starting point and it's never too early in the morning, Renata, my friend, to make that point really. And um, uh, so how do we make this a reality? I think so to make this a reality, uh, all of us have a few pet elevator pitches. So if you ask, uh, you know, somebody, they would say, uh, perhaps by starting to respect the environment, someone will say something else. But I think um, the, the bottom line is that we need to forge a new relationship between the people's commons and the public institutions for which the state's, state is responsible. So it's essentially the broken building is that building uh, where I think somewhere we uh, lost our way and we stopped nurturing the people's commons and we stopped nurturing the public. And therefore, you know, we actually saw that initially the foundation started moving because of uh, neoliberalism, privatization, and in the context of Africa, not to forget 40 years ago, structural adjustment programs. Uh, the consequences of which we are uh, seeing in history even today, right? And eventually, what happened because of that was that the collective ways of being and doing were delegitimized, and over a period of time, uh, the nuts and bolts that were available for the commons that the people protected uh, were gone. So we are looking at um, what you were rightly referring to as a debris, you know, of these broken structures where the relationship between the commons and the public is lost and we really have the task to glue it back. And that's when a new technological paradigm can be born. So what would be the characteristics of this? One is that we do need in this paradigm to build knowledge ecosystems that are co-owned by people. Uh, we do not belong in a space where uh, the centralization of knowledge as uh, it exists um, you know, we've really seen a spate of judgments from courts in the US. Um, we really think that um, people's knowledge infrastructures cannot be large monopolies, right? So there is this idea of the social overhead capital. When you talk about Keynesian economics, what is social overhead capital? Social overhead capital is a term that's often used to describe the basic, the foundational infrastructures and services that need to support economic activity, but not just economic activity, but also quality of life in a society, which means we are talking about how we weld together economics with society and make economics subservient to societal goals and societal aspirations. And this will call for a range of public investments because you simply cannot get the tech right without getting uh, the basics of the socioeconomic logics right. And this means that we really need utilities we need communication networks, we need um, uh, social care facilities, we need to completely underwrite um, uh, human resource development, make education a basic right in society, etc. I may seem like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, submitting this litany of um, uh, things that seem commonsensical, but what's really happened is that in the platform society that we live in, um, we seem to have lost uh, sense of the common sense. And uh, therefore, uh, to recall that uh, um, the social overhead capital is a function of the state, which means, you know, we have the DPG Alliance here and 
we really need a, a function of the public um, to be uh, preserved. And this should be the contribution of public finance, uh, public governance, and public rights. So the, the idea of public rights, which is that I don't really uh, need for that right to be vested in me uh, at an individual level, but because I'm a member of society at large, that right uh, inheres in me, you know? So that is the idea. So the next uh, thing is that our pathways are very imperfect uh, to look for the alternatives, but they must be forged because politics is always contingent. It's it's relative to time and space. And often uh, we get paralyzed when we look at this, uh, you know, big tech scenario and we feel we can't begin anywhere. But I think that uh, to embrace ambiguity, to embrace imperfection and try our experiments, and if we have time, I would like to come back in the next round to talk about a couple of experiments that um, my organization is undertaking at this point in time. Uh, but to conclude the conceptual uh, part, I really want to say that we need a rearticulation of our foundational rights. And what I find very, very interesting is that in the context of the Brazilian judicial system and its tensions with market monopolies like X, uh, we see that these tensions are navigable and they are being interpreted and reinterpreted thanks to the Marco Civil Internet. So we really, I think, need to move uh, more and more towards uh, guarantees and foundational rights. And I am completely seized coming from the global south of the limits to formalizing rights. We need to do a lot more, uh, you know, on the ground. But I think that also recognizing that the regime of digital human rights requires us to rearticulate uh, existing rights is uh, really important. Um, finally, I really want to say that the market is a very key player changing and challenging democracy. And therefore, uh, I would say that uh, democracy uh, development and people's sovereignty need to be seen as one of a piece and the technology we want is at one and the same time about economic democracy as it is about social democracy. So I will leave it there and come back and talk to you a little bit about the experiments that we've been engaged in. Thank you, Anita. It's very good that you you mentioned Marco Civil. I mean, 10, 10 years ago, I remember we were there, you know, we were in Brazil and it was a it was a big gain uh, for global civil society because uh, we made one of the largest countries in the world, one of the most powerful countries in the world shift direction and embrace net neutrality and em embrace privacy and em 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 embrace many rights that will, will in spite of all the political changes remain uh, and, um, and it was a very interesting um, situation because it was a big push internationally and big solidarity internationally for a national uh, process uh, so and Marco Civil wouldn't have uh, been passed by the government in place back then if it was not because of this international solidarity, but also a lot of bottom-up activities uh, from digital communities in Brazil. And uh, is this in the communities where, like you know, many of the hopes um, remain? And um, and I'm going to pass to uh, Ponselet, who's in, in the youngest continent today. Africa is the youngest continent today where many of the hopes and many of the solutions of many of the problems uh, we have today uh, they are, are there. Like many, many, many young people are connecting for the first time uh, and are like they're bringing new ideas and bringing new hopes mm -hmm. to all of us. So Ponsele, tell us, uh, do you think that a radical change is possible? And what is like, you know, the vision from uh, your experience working with young, young people in Africa? Uh, and the political willingness of just stay the same or embrace change. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Renata and uh, Anita, for a good um, opening and remark. Um, I think um, what when we look at today, what is happening within the African continent, we are in a continent whereby we have only 37% of the population still on broadband. And um, you look at a population of almost um, the same population of um, a continent of almost the same population of um, India and China, um, 1.4 1, 1. billion people approximately, of which 60% are 
our young people and the continent is getting younger and younger. And um, we, we take, for example, what happened during um, the COVID um, period um, when we had that um, pandemic that affected the whole world. Africa, though we had, um, there's no, um, one life is uh, very important, not to talk of thousands dying, but within the overall um, context of um, what happened during the COVID, we were more affected as a continent in terms of socioeconomic development. For example, Uganda, schools were not open for more than one year. And if we had digital technologies and we had um, access to the internet, in most parts of Africa, kids could have been able to go to school, you know, using um, online tools like it happened in other parts of the world. So we are we are now faced with this situation of, yes, within this um, um, in, um, fourth revolution of what are we going to do to guide us to get where we have to, to get. The summit of the future came up with um, good recommendations. And I think um, I will reference one of those recommendations in um, the um, um, the Pact to the Summit document under Action 27. We will seize the opportunities associated with new and emerging technologies and address the potential risk posed by their misuse. Under that agenda, we'll discover that a lot of things were addressed on under that action 27 and i will i will start by emphasizing on c c said enhance international cooperation and capacity building efforts it will order to enable us to bridge the digital divide among states you know so uh and when when we look at that um our purpose for me in a radical shift of how things are being done is how we are going to address from bottom to top, dealing with bridging this digital divide, using solutions like setting up community networks, using satellites. A lot of people might not like the approach sometimes of Elon Musk, but the reality as in a meeting he had with William Ruto, the president of Kenya during the um, um, summit of the future was that, as William Ruto said, um, it will make Starlink coming to Kenya will make our ISPs and telecos step up in providing services they have to do. So despite we have our telcos fighting Starlink in different parts of Africa not to come, whereas they have not been able to deliver solutions that will alleviate those at the bottom of the ladder and majority are youths to be able to use technologies to benefit their communities. So we need solutions, radical solutions like that. Getting Starlink, getting other, the EU, they have a satellite program that can help our government to get connect, um, um, connected to, um, in terms of offering better e-government services like we see in Rwanda. So we have to be able to do this within an international um, cooperation modus operandi, whereby it is fair. And for it to be fair, there has to be openness of the data we use. And that is where I am more concerned about that. Within our continent, we have our Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Less than 20 African countries have, have rectified and signed that convention. But most of the African countries, we are very GDP compliant, but within our own framework, we are not ready to be compliant. So how are we going to address digital uh, inclusion? Also preserving our uh, digital sovereignty within an open framework. There are a lot of documents already existing in the continent that can guide us to do this, apart from what our African leaders decided in, in 2013, the African Union came up with Agenda 2063. Agenda 2063, it will be 100 years when the African Union was formed. And by that time, a lot of things are supposed to be achieved. Within that Agenda 2063, 
Also, a document came out in 2020, the African Union Digital Transformation Strategy 2020 to 2030. How are we going to use that to enable us to benefit from better international corporations working with stakeholders to give people meaningful connectivity that will uplift their, their lives? And that is the key question we all have to try to, to answer. And I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that starting from a grassroots approach through community networks with open data as a key, we can achieve that. Thank you for now. Thank you, Ponselet, and I will go back to you on this, you know, like a tricky question of colonization and new colonization through technology and whether, like, you know, um, the continent is creating their own technology. But now I will go to Bolaji. Bolaji uh, is the uh, digital public goods evangelist at the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and you will tell us more about it. But I get that the, uh, the interesting thing of this alliance is that you have to, one of the main stakeholders of the alliance is government. And I guess that is something that we are going to uh, discuss through the day is that um, governments have different, like, you know, pressure and needs and, and community-led projects and or citizen uh, initiatives. They want solutions now, they want solutions fast, and they, they want that uh, they, um, there's a very low, uh, in my experience, you know, very low um, space tolerance from citizens when the government deploys a, a solution, digital solution, it must work. And it must work fine for everybody. So from your experience, is 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 there a political willingness of governments to try and test technologies that are not the mainstream te technologies? What is the case to be made when you're dealing with the governments or to adopt technologies that are you know like more rights preserving, more like smaller projects and not just coming from the big tech corporations? But to you, Bolaj. Thank you very much, um, Renata, and thanks, Anita and Ponselet, for the wonderful comments you've made so far. First, um, I'm glad this conversation is happening. I mean, we have like hundreds of people here today talking and conversing about this, which shows we do care about the tech we want. We all taking times out from our busy schedules. And I think it's it's very important with the rise of so many kind of tools, as you mentioned, Renata, for us to remind ourselves the value of building sustainable public interest software that solves problems generated by this crisis and conflicts that we all see around us. I think I would like to start by um, quoting Thibault. It said something, says, if we, if we create a product we like that never ends up in people's hands, how are we working for? How are we working beyond ourselves? How can we fix that? How do we know you're waking, making the world a better place and not just creating software for people with a free time and a spare laptop? And, you know, developing goals in coordination with our primary audiences is a much needed opportunity for self-reflection. I think that's what we're doing here today. We all self-reflect and trying to figure out how exactly can we build the tech we want and how can we do that in alliance with the government. And in our case, the primary audience here is people. These people are the ones being affected by this crisis and conflict. And to answer the question, you know, trying to figure out what role does technology play in this? And is this already happening? And how is that happening in alliance with the government, right? And I think there are two main points I would, I would like to underscore today in terms of this radical shift and also seeing how that leads to governments being able to use the solutions. One is redefining how we actually build this tech that we want and also rebuilding the tech that we want to serve humanity and the planet. And as Renat had mentioned earlier, uh, I'm here representing the DPG community. And in this community, we see this radical shift already happening in alliance with the government. And the Digital Public Goods Alliance accelerates the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals by facilitating the discovery, the development, and use and investment in digital public goods. And if this is the first time you're hearing the word digital public goods, it's, it's basically a set of open source software, open standards, open data, open AI systems, and content collections that adhere to privacy and other applicable laws, best practices, do no harm, and help attain the SDGs. Now, at the DPG, we, we not only steward and maintain the DPG standard, which is how we actually operationalize this definition I just described, and 
this def this definition I described and this standard also leads to like an increased adaptability of these solutions because they all adhere to like a minimum standard. And we get to seeing how this is very important because then governments can actually use these solutions. And not only also do we have the DPG registry where we actually showcase 150 plus of the tech we want, many of which would actually be demoed tomorrow. And I'm actually looking forward to seeing, you know, those sessions. But we are also a members-based alliance where we bring together creators, you know, implementers, supporters, working towards this shared global vision for digital public goods. And we coordinate resources and mobilize people to ensure that we can facilitate the healthier and sustainability ecosystem for this tech that we want. And I mean, amongst these like-minded organizations, we have like organizations like the Open Knowledge Foundation, Open Forum Europe. I, I see Nick is, is here today. And we also work with governments, right? We we have amongst our members, Sierra Leone, Germany, Ethiopia, Estonia, Singapore, Dominican Republic, and a bunch of others. We have also UN agencies and, and others. And one of the key objectives of the DPG, as we as you would see in our five-year strategy, and it is already being implemented, is that we want to ensure that DPGs have a high potential for addressing critical development needs and urgent global challenges, right? And in just a few years, we are seeing these already, you know, happening and we're seeing this working. And because it's working, governments are actually using these tools, right? Governments are actually deploying these solutions and using them to actually solve problems for the citizens. And I'll just run through a couple of you know, just to show you how this works and to see how it's very important that we actually rebuild how this technology are designed. First, you have like solutions like, like OpenCRS, which is a software for civil registration designed for low resource settings. And I mean, you would agree with me that civil registration is the foundation of legal identities and right-based service delivery. And you have what you call a civil registration and vital statistics system, which records all major live events like births, deaths, marriage, and all of that. And without this working effectively in many countries, it's almost impossible for governments to actually do anything. And in many countries, you find today CVR systems are broken. Like one in four children under the age of five actually have not been registered and technically don't exist. And without them existing, they're really struggling to assess like basic rights, like education, healthcare, and, and a couple of others. And you also find issues with like debts not being recorded. Without that, governments cannot actually design effective public health policies to measure their impact. And many of these issues issues are being increasingly solved because governments are now able to use these solutions like open CRS. I mean, we have like examples also like Ushahidi, which is like a crowdsourcing mapping tool. And for example, last year in September, we had like Storm Daniel, which like hits like Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Libya. And it was one of the largest and discovery um, destructive cyclone we had. And the impact of this cyclone brought together like-minded volunteers to actually facilitate disaster recovery. Right. And you see that in crises like floods, communities actually feel helpless and, def and defeated. Right. But these technologies actually provide ways for people to actually work together to report near time events in real time. And then you, know, you have more solutions in the health space and, you know, you have these solutions coming together to connect together. And the key thing is that all these solutions are designed in ways that are different from all the libraries we NPM or PIP install. I'm a software engineer. I've been involved in the process of also building this same software, right? And I see how these things work and it's a recurring um, concern. I think Patricio mentioned that earlier in the introduction that we see this happening over time and we are all talking about many of these things and we want to now talk about how exactly can we make this work? And it's key that this would not work if we do not work with the government. And for us to work with the government, we actually have to build these things with certain standards that make them interoperable and adoptable across multiple countries, right? And this is the part that makes DPG different from, you know, proprietary softwares and even your typical open source projects. Because in order for us to disrupt correct patterns, people need access to solutions they can adapt to their unique contextual needs. And this is a problem you find in many countries. The needs are quite different, right? And we have these public goods being designed to work in different settings, taking into consideration the geographical differences where they'll be used, you know, um, um, the previous speaker just spoke a little bit about the context of how these issues are in Africa and in some countries, and they are designed to be interoperable, right, so that other solutions can also exchange data, extending the value of these systems. The systems are designed to follow, you know, open standards, best practices. They're designed to anticipate, to prevent and do no harm by design. They protect their users. They're designed to ensure the privacy and security and integrity of PI data. You know, and more importantly, these solutions end up becoming part of countries' digital public infrastructure, right? And we've seen this happen over time. And so the DPG standard, for example, shapes how technology is built, 
we're ensuring that developers now are able to build the tech we want by offering them an opportunity to assess how their solutions are built, ensuring it is open, it is platform independent, and it adheres to privacy and applicable laws. And with this, we are now rebuilding that tech to serve humanity. And governments are also being able to actually work with us, being able to use these solutions, because it's no longer a case of, hey, let's do this. Let's, let's solve this problem. There are many problems. But we're saying, hey, there are problems. Here are solutions. We've done some stuff. This is how we can scale them. This is how we can use them. And this is how we are seeing this evolve over time. And the DPGs offer like a unique value in that sense. And I'm really keen to see much more of how this would grow. And we're seeing that grow in the ecosystem and seeing how the governments are also being more willing to, you know, adopt these DPGs in their DPIs and also support these DPGs. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. It is very exciting because um, it is not many of the things are not new. Right? You know, like many of the pieces of software, like you know, have been around three decades, two decades. But the interesting part is that the Digital Public Goods Alliance, because it's government led, um, it is helping. Is that's a, a signal? You know, it was like you know, Norway, Ethiopia, and other countries started because it it is offering us discoverability, and maybe we don't have you know like the private room and the private meeting as Bill Gates has with the global leaders. But we like like what the, the Digital Public Goods Alliance is uh, helping uh, free software and open source products is getting a little bit closer from the places where decisions are made and offering a platform for, um, I mean, if you are working in a project that has the potential of scalability and fulfills of the requirements that, um, that were described, I mean, it's an excellent opportunity to to be closer uh, to uh, communities that might be able to use it. And of course, it's not perfect. And of course, we need better uh, democratic interaction with the governments, more space for civil society. And, and but it is, uh, it is a good start. But one of the things that um, it's always like, you know, when I'm, I'm discussing this, the, uh, the politics and the probabilities is like, um, I was talking to a European colleague, and it's like, a, oh, forget about it. Everything is done. We cannot catch up with big tech. We, our communities will never have, like, you know, from Europe context that has a lot of money and resources and, and uh, say, no, we will never be able to build those technologies ourselves. But I think that Anita has a very concrete example of precisely the opposite on um, when we say that we can do things and there's political willingness of the communities amazing things can happen could you share anita what you have been doing with the communities uh, over there certainly thank you so much renata um also i think examples that were shared before are also very inspiring of course they are at scale so the examples i'm going to talk about are not really at scale but they enable us to uh, imagine and reimagine what can be done in a, in a very embedded way. And um, we work very closely with uh, women-led uh, farmer producer organizations in two states in India. And uh, in, in that project, we uh, aim to build uh, an app-based platform that offers uh, 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 women in farming uh, the ability to actually control their uh, supply chains. Um, we are also working with another partner who is creating a platform for uh, young women uh, informal workers in the beauty sector. And uh, the platform is enabling them to uh, recast uh, the kind of uh, social contract uh, that uh, usually uh, they have with these big companies, which is really um, without any social security, without any income guarantee and a whole lot of precarity. So um, these are the two platform models. And I really want to add a caveat when I speak about this. Our intervention in, in to design these alternative platform models cannot substitute for the role of the state, not just in provisioning platforms. You know, my colleagues in the panel spoke about, you know, what kind of interventions are possible and what kind of digital public goods need to be out there. But I, I'm also referring to the role of the state in, in its allocative and distributive functions, whereby let's say uh, for small farmers or peasants, uh, typically you know, who may be women, um, a whole lot of uh, economic support is needed. You, know, you need to have access to capital, access to markets, you need to have 
uh, and there are many barriers to the market. So uh, our platform interventions are really, uh, unfortunately, they're patchwork. Even then, I would recommend we not lose hope. We know that these uh, interventions cannot address the fundamental constraints of the wider uh, markets, right? The asymmetries in these markets. But what they do is they do two things. One is they provide the solidarization base, the solidarity and the solidarization base, right? You bring um, isolated workers, you know, working for a kind of an urban service company, you bring them together, you enable them to interrogate um, whether they should be penalized because the woman wanted to go back home since it was getting late and she needed to go back and fix a meal for her children. So if you are typically locked up to a commercial platform, the platform will demote you, right? It'll say, oh, you, you refused two of my orders. So we're not going to give you the next order. So without fear of penalization, right? Um, uh, the, the platform coding, the design through uh, the, the intermediary, social intermediary institutions we are working with enable us to visualize uh, new possibilities so that women uh, try to think about these platforms as not givens, as not uh, this kind of totalizing uh, uh, no choice situation, but code, software, data as very, very uh, fluid. Uh, it enables women to imagine that, yes, you know, if uh, the code allows us not to be penalized, then maybe I will get my full wage, right? So to, uh, the algorithmic management um, uh, of uh, dominant companies is completely subverted uh, in the case of uh, design and technological platform design that is made through social intermediaries where women's voices uh, can be programmed in. Uh, so this is one example. And in the case of... Uh, the rural women, I really want to say that uh, they operate in very low trust environments. You know, oftentimes um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, being integrated into this mobile world means there are lots of fraudsters. Oftentimes people are taking money away from you. And, you know, we are one of the countries where uh, online fraud is highest, you know. So uh, what happens is when you introduce a trusted system, which is managed by people you can go to, which are frontline workers, uh, women farmers, any you know, are able to build a relationship of trust with the technology. They're able to appreciate what that platform is doing for their value chain, for their uh, value generation, etc. Uh, I just want to conclude by saying that we are also engaged in building public AI with the government of Kerala, and the entire process is to uh, look at language learning and how teachers can be enabled to perform assessments of uh, students through uh, oral uh, language expression. You know, we are locked in, I think, unfortunately, into um, a pedagogic system that uh, overvalorizes writing, uh, whereas many of our cultures are actually hugely oral, right? You would all agree with me. And so what this does is it's a very, very elementary, but very elegant technology. Again, uh, turning all our assumptions about sophistication on its head, and uh, this is another experiment where we are enabling the school system not to really uh, rate the child, but to enable the teacher to assess what the child needs in the classroom in terms of language learning. So, I mean, we don't have enough time, so I won't be able to elaborate this. But I also want to say that there are other, uh, you know, uh, islands of hope in India. And uh, one of them is also the intervention by the Kerala Food Platform. It's a backbone platform for aggregation of farming produce that the government is providing. It's a very hard ask because there are perishables, uh, there are food grains, and to set up uh, the centralization, decentralization dynamic, you know, the state has to invest a lot of thinking, but the fact that we are beginning to think about platforms for development, data for development, AI for development in a way that really looks at a distributed uh, ecology of technology which can come together through some kind of minimal orchestration with values and principles is very encouraging. I just wanted to uh, share these experiments with you. Thank you, Anita. And, uh, and it give, gives us hope, you know, uh, people, we, we are technophilic organization, you know, like uh, we are not like, okay, let's go like, you know, back to 
offline and back to disconnect. But the, the power of collaboration and organization when you embed values in the code. And when you have a state that will, you know, like uh, enable you to have alternatives rather than crushing the alternatives. And in, in that order of ideas, I mean, um, uh, Poncelet, you talked a lot, you know, like about the, you know, like the, the possibilities when some technology, disruptive technology such as the Starlink, uh, you know, satellites come and, you know, like uh, the, the, uh, obviously, the the need of more than sixty percent of the population in Africa is disconnected. And um, but how do you balance the the you know like the, these opportunities of connectivity and access to technology with the risks that come from technologies that come with you know like no there's no no such a thing as a free lunch. And when there's a lot of uh, there's a big race for political control of Africa by the West by many other countries and uh, a lot of domination of tech companies uh, in, in your countries. How do you balance that? And do you think that there's a space for African-made or African-led uh, technological projects? Um, to counter? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I think um, if we look at our continent to be very, like there's a big scramble now about, uh, you know, whether it's the West, whether it's China, whether it's India, Everybody looking at um, Africa for us as the um, the next and um, generation of tiger economies. If we had to take examples from what happened in Asia, but the bottom line is that we have to fix certain things within our own um, strategies. Um, looking at it from what the African Union is trying to do, I'll take a good example of emerging technologies. For example, the African Union now has an AI. Um, strategy for the continent you know um similar to the ai act for for the european union you know so what we have to try to do um to counter and remove the fears is one adopting our own african made strategies the a good start is the uh, Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, so that people really understand it at grassroots level, what it means for your personal data. This wanting getting access to technology, but this wanting also understanding the risks those technologies can um, have, you know, and that is why um, we look at the aspect of um, digital sovereignty. A lot of African nations are working through the Internet Society of Africa and other entities to set up um, data centers that they can manage and, um, and control their own data in country. Because there's this fear about what are the data being used, you know, are data being harvested from the continents for other purposes and stuff like that. So we have to institutionalize it and making sure that our le leaders that sign up to all these um, continental agreements make it really work at grassroots level. It's, it's difficult sometimes doing it, but one thing that is good, we just um, finished the World Summit on Information Society plus 20 um, meeting for Africa hosted by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in um, Dar es Salaam um, um, just last week. We, we, within the context of that, we look, um, a lot of, um, talk was around cyber security, you know, securing people's data. How do we see the WCS plus 20 within the African um, continent spearheaded by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa? So Africa leaders and people in technology, they know that protecting our data is a good way to start. And to protect that data, we have to inst institutionalize our local laws just as the EU has done very well with the um, general data um, protection regulation. So that is one way in doing it. So that whether it's community networks, whether it's any um, satellite link that people are using to get access and new technologies, um, things can happen in, in, in the continent. We have a long way to go, but the strength is that our leaders know that they have to do it. There are some good examples already happening in Rwanda, um, in, in Kenya, in, in Cabo Verde, Mauritius were the first African country to have an AI strategy with emerging technologies. So there are good examples and we can learn from each other. And I will, we can also learn about how we can create 
better openness in the use of open data. A lot of African countries are talking about open data. Citizens, a lot of citizens still don't have any digital identification. With digital identification, you open a lot of opportunities. But at the end of the day, regulation is important and regulation has to come from a continental perspective as we can get better lessons to learn from um, the EU. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ponselet. And, and um, I mean, you might not be aware, uh, audience, but there's many amazing things happening. Like uh, the same way that in in early days, like not 20 years ago, we were discussing, for example, licenses. Now, African uh, lawyers are crafting their own licenses, open licenses to share uh, AI commons, uh, of, uh, voice, and AI commons on, on other imagery. Uh, with new innovative licenses that are like you know going to shake up the open license licensing world very soon. There's also a lot of innovation in drones technology for uh, development purposes. That it's kept, all the innovation is coming from Africa. The, the most innovative uses and community wise, I think that the level of awareness of um, uh, workers is is also taking off and it's it's going to bring a, a lot of interesting. Um, conversations that we can learn from a lot in, in other countries. Uh, just to close before we open for questions, uh, Volaji, uh, what is the thing like, you know, when we think about the, the political willingness of uh, adopting different technologies, what's the thing that makes you mo most hopeful of the work that you're doing currently? And it doesn't have to be like limited to Africa, you can just share your broad experience working as an African in this global uh, uh, community. Yeah. Thank you very much, Renata. Well, I think one of the things why I'm really hopeful is actually seeing that this tech we want, as we're mentioning, and as many others have spoken about today, you know, it's it's been built slowly. Whether or not we have that huge landscape for that, it's been built, and it's actually being used by countries. So it's not as though we're speaking just about theories right now, but we're actually seeing these things being used. Right. And some of the speakers just, you know, mentioned how these things are, are being implemented in many of these countries. And the key focus for me here now is seeing the fact that because these solutions are so interoperable, it's easier now for countries to actually use more than one of them. Right. And we're slowly beginning to see countries where even most of their DPIs are built off digital public goods, right? And it's like the entire focus is in using public goods to serve the citizens and not just even the citizens, but also actually training public service officers to actually understand how to use these services. And I think that's also very key because we've gotten to the point where everyone needs to be involved, right? The government is involved, the people is involved, the public service officers are involved, right? And sometimes we do have the experience, you know, more than certain persons will do. Some of the public service officers might not have as much experience as, as we do, right? And we're getting to the point where we are sharing knowledge across each other. And that's why the Alliance, we have so many members, you know, working on different activities. You could check some of those activities on the roadmap of the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And you see how members from different countries are actually being involved in ensuring that DPG is actually tried. DPGs are actually being used. DPGs are actually being developed. And that gives me so much joy because it's now much more than just theory. And we're seeing that it's growing. We're seeing that the SDGs are being, you know, are being achieved through the use of these DPGs and, and these solutions. And we want to see more of that. And I guess that's why we are all here trying to define what that looks like and, and how we can move forward and how we can know that this is happening. And this conversation now is no longer siloed to just, you know, those in the public health um public services, but also to regular engineers who probably don't know these things we're talking about, right? I know Patricia mentioned earlier, and it's like, these conversations are mostly only siloed to like a few subset of people. And the people who actually have the the, the high impact to like um, influence what we are doing probably don't know so much of what's happening or how they can be involved. And so I'm happy to see that, you know, the governments are actually being involved to know what's happening, to know how they can use these tools, how they can support these tools, what do students actually even mean and how it will work in their DPIs? And more importantly, seeing that now engineers can actually be involved in this process and it goes beyond, hey, we're just building software tools, but we're actually being careful to think about how exactly is this software solving problems? How is it helping people, right? How is it even solving my own problem? And it goes beyond just, you know, writing a piece of code and shipping that. And now everyone is involved, the people is involved, the government is involved, and we're all trying to ensure that we can have a better world.
Thank you so much. And, and one of the reflections uh, after this, you know, like yeah, we, like uh, governments more or less, um, political parties, when they want to access pa uh, power, you know, more or less have an agenda for jobs, job creation, environment, education, and so on. And the technology is always, you know, these flashy solutions on uh, uh, relying heavily on big tech. I think that is time that also some movement and the open movement also push uh, any political party across the spectrum of uh, different political positions of have an answer to us and have an op opening to uh, uh, to technology that is sustainable and that it is open, that is transparent and so on. So hopefully, you know, like we can each, uh, like, you know, five point, uh, five point um, recommendations to all political pa pa parties globally. So to shift us to shift the political support. Um, uh, we have um, been aware of time. We have like, some time for some questions from the audience. If uh, you have a question, please you can react, raise your hand, and then open your camera and ask any question to the panelists. Uh, please uh, uh, make sure that you introduce yourself. And uh, okay, uh, let's see how many. I'm just trying to see all the attendees. Okay, uh, we have a question from Stephen. Please open your camera and ask the question. Be brief and, and indicate to whom you're asking the question. Uh, hi. Um, thanks to all the speakers so far. It's been fantastic. Uh, it's late for me, so I have to ask a question quickly or I might not be here all night. Um, uh, so I'm Stephen. I'm, I work with us uh, with CCAM, which is a digital public good. Um, it, just in response to some of the sessions and some of the mo uh, moments sort of talks about digital public goods, um, digital public goods alliance, uh, there's a strong sentiment that as intermediaries, um, folks who work with civic tech, um, there is a big conversation to have about, you know, what's the best solution, what's a good solution, what's a proper solution for implementing uh, civic oriented solutions for citizens and governments. But there is a supply side to that technology mentioning something like, you know, Starlink, there's the satellites, there's a whole bunch of like really big infrastructure investments that do, uh, are part of technology, right? It's not just the software or the implementations. So some of that cost is quite large. Um, there's also really successful markets that do do this well. So the social and economic capital in areas like financial technology or health technology, um, there's a lot more valence, I guess, that like the ecosystem is more connected and sort of like in, in balance between the social capital and the um, economic capital that's generated in those sort of markets. So in the civic tech, which I, is what I presume we're kind of focused more in, um, in this sort of call, um, what would be the, the biggest sort of like inefficiencies or, you know, areas to actually focus on because my from my perspective it's usually demand so demand for open data for example really drives in government um, the supply of open data that used to be a supply-led activity and it was started that way but you kind of need both the demand for data from citizens the supply of data from governments and all of the uh, legislative acts and things like that um, and then in the middle the intermediaries can do a really good job but yeah, that, that's that's kind of like a successful sort of situation. But in the case of DPGs more generally in civic tech, what is it that we're fighting for? What is it we're trying to fix apart from, you know, all, all, all the normal big stuff? Okay, I will let Volaji answer that one. And, and I guess that Anita also wants to intervene. Uh, if you want to say something also, let me know. Okay, Volaji, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for asking that, um, Stephen. I think it, it lies more on the last words you say, which is like, what exactly are we trying to do then with this digital public goods, right? And if you observe, you see that in the DPG standard, for example, we have this, you know, this indicators, right? And those indicators actually cover the entire goal of trying to ensure that we have these solutions that are designed in a certain kind of way. As you mentioned, when the demand is there, right, the supply comes in, right? And demand would only come to a certain kind of software, kinds of, you know, open data, kind of product are built with certain, you know, certain standards, certain best practices. The demand is not coming for, let's say, 
um, proprietary software alone or coming to some certain kind of project. Demand is coming to a unique kind of tech that we want. And because now this standard is actually being implemented on DPGs like Seekan, for example, we now can actually supply that demand, right? We have solutions that actually meet demands that the governments you know, have. And because we now have the demand, we now can actually supply. Now we're having a scenario where governments actually know where to come to. You know, They know who to talk to. They know what to actually place their focus on in that sense in terms of you know, how do we use this stuff? How do we support this stuff? How do we invest in this stuff? Which we're seeing happening like in many countries in that sense. So I would say that the digital public goods it's like it's a it's a unique position because like we, you're disrupting the pattern of how this thing should exist, and it makes it easier for us to actually have these conversations because we're starting from like a baseline where I understand when I say I'm talking about the digital public. Could you agree with me? It's the same base minimum standard, so we can now talk about how can we use all of them as opposed to where in a scenario where it's like. I'm not so sure what this is built with. I'm not so sure how this was built. How do I trust this system? You know, countries are very concerned about how the systems are matured, how how they are usable, and all of that stuff. But because this is a base standard, it's easier for us to have this conversation and move forward to how do we scale? How do we implement? Now we know that this is like it checks all the, the boxes. Now let's try to use them. You know, so I think that's kind of like thinking around many of this. And I think I would let um, Anita. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anita. And then we will go to Sarishu has a question. Yes, mine is a, a small point, but I think it's important. I think what's documented also is that uh, we do need to uh, look at the way in which uh, these public goods or civic tech uh, can contribute to public value. Uh, what I mean is that the leaching away of public benefit and public value because uh, some of these are taken in uh, put into proprietary ecosystems, which then locks up uh, part of uh, what they were originally not intended to do. You know, I think that's a real risk. And I would say that this has been documented more recently, just a month ago, I uh, saw an assessment, you know, the, done by uh, one of these uh, big fives, you know, consulting companies. Uh, in Africa as to which are those two, three companies which are actually picking up from the DPGs and uh, enjoying contracts with big governments. So I think that uh, the commons are always at risk of free riding and foul dealing. And I think it's uh, phenomenally important for us uh, to take care of uh, that. And it, it, it's, I think, a profoundly important question. We need guardrails. Um, I would also say that uh, the global public goods um, kind of idea needs a little bit more thinking about who will contribute to the public goods, who will benefit from this, what are the regimes uh, that will intervene so that we don't make interoperability this god uh, with an order that can never be challenged. Thank you so much, Anita. And just to close uh, quickly, Sergio Santa Marina, could you make your question? And, we, and then speakers just one minute to respond because the other panel is already here yeah i just wanted to ask if it's possible to talk about the public digital public good or any public good without that section you know i remember in the porto alegre in 2001 when we have this uh meeting a uh, social forum, uh world social forum we we, we talk about taxation the the global taxation in order to build uh, and protect common goods. Uh, and that conversation is out of the picture now. And the, the disparity and the, and, and the, and the way the, the, the tech companies are, are growing and, and we just depend on charity from them. Uh, and, and, and we cannot uh, have governance from part of the states because they are smaller in comparison with the big tech companies. So without taxation, there is no possibility for digital common goods or even uh, ecological common goods because everything is uh, first profit, then whatever is left out, uh, we can play with. Uh, Sergio, I think that you, you gave us the idea of the next summit, actually. <laughs> the next one day summit should be how to fund the tech we want, how to fund and fund, sustain, maintain and and grow uh, the tech we want. I think that that's a non-answer question that we we cannot not possibly respond in one minute. And it's a very important uh, divorce that we need to like, you know, to fix 
because the technology conversations are absolutely isolated from the global finance conversations. And it's something that we have neglected and that we need to like fix. Uh, absolutely to your point, we will address that. And um, uh, with that, uh, I will let the speakers answer uh, in the chat to your question if they have the specific opinions. And we will move to the um, the next in the sequence, the next panel. The tech we want is built and maintained with care, which might answer some of your questions. Uh, so, here. Uh, so thank you so much for the panel and for all the attendees. And uh, over to you, Sarah. We continue now.